Just give them a good praise right there. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to ask if you wouldn't mind just standing with me as we read from the Word of God, the Gospel of St. Matthew, the fourth chapter. We're going to begin reading at the third verse, the fourth verse, amen, and the seventh verse, amen. Matthew chapter 4, and the third verse says, And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Verse number six. And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And in verse number seven, Jesus said unto him, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Amen. Just turn to somebody and say, It's not about the bread. You may be seated in his presence. Come on and tell the Lord, thank you. Hallelujah. Come on and say, hallelujah. Come on and say, yes, Lord. In the name of Jesus, let your will be done, O God, in Jesus' name. We pray that none would be lacking or incomplete, but that the Spirit of God would fill you and that he would speak to your hearts and your mind. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Amen. Before we get into this text, I just want to reiterate one of the announcements that we have began prayer circles in this church. Amen. And we will use our conference line for those circles. What I'm asking is that you would gather with three or four other people, maybe five or six. You find a time during the week where you all can pray together for just 10 minutes Amen. And you can claim a spot on that prayer line. The reason we need you to write in on that sign up sheet in the back is so that we don't have two groups overlapping. Amen. But you can use the prayer line because it is important that we cover one another in prayer. Hallelujah. You do know that when you pray for others, that is a weapon for you. That as you're praying for me, the Bible says pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayers of the righteous availeth much. Amen. So after service, amen, just grab somebody, say, hey, are you on a prayer circle? Let's get together, figure out a time. Amen. And what that will do is allow this house to have prayer going on all throughout the week. Come on and say hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I used this analogy on Wednesday night. You wouldn't get in your car and drive from here to Ohio without pulling over for gas. Amen. You would end up surely on the side of the road calling AAA. Amen. And prayer is our fuel as believers. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. That's why the Bible says men ought to always pray. Because you need prayer going on for the situations that you're facing. Come on and say hallelujah. Glory to God. That's the only way not to be weary and well-doing. Amen. Is if you are keeping that wheel of prayer ever turning in your life. Amen. Praise the Lord. We thank God for Elder Green being here. Come on and say amen for him. Amen. 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 He has an internship and is, is on ministry assignment here with us. Amen. And we just thank God for you being here in the house of the Lord. Amen. We thank God for the Davises being back. Amen. We thank God for you all for safe travels. Amen. And we bless the Lord for our visitors and for each and every one that's in the house. Come on and say amen. It's not about the bread. I believe the Lord is giving us a word, not just a word, but an in-season word for where we are. Thank you, Jesus. We begin reading in Matthew chapter 4. 
and we're reading about Jesus being led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And he has fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights. And it is at this moment that the enemy comes to tempt him. But before the wilderness, before the fast, Jesus is born in Bethlehem of Judea. And wise men come from the east and they say that we are seeking one, the king of the Jews. They go to King Herod and says, we're seeking the king of the Jews. That's like going to your boss saying, I'm seeking your job. So they told the king they were looking for the king of the Jews and that he was born. And we saw his star appear in the sky. King Herod is inwardly jealous. He doesn't let on to the wise men. And he says, once you find him, send me word. But his plan was not to go and honor or worship Jesus. His plan was to kill Jesus. Jesus is just a baby and King Herod wants to destroy him. Which tells me that the enemy does not have an age requirement before he attacks. Which is why we must cover our sons and our daughters in this next generation in prayer. Come on and say hallelujah. That's why you don't give your children the option whether or not they go into church. Because you're putting armor on them. You're protecting them. You're guarding them. And even though they don't understand it, the enemy will attack at any age. But Jesus is born in Bethlehem of Judea, despite the fact that the enemy is trying to kill him. The enemy is bent on killing him, but the Lord showed up to Joseph in a dream. And the Lord told Joseph, take this child down to Egypt and stay there until I give you word. And so they go down to Egypt. And if you read the scripture, you will find out that the prophecy also came, not just that he would be born in Bethlehem in Judea, but that it is out of Egypt that he has called his son. So Jesus had to be in hiding in Egypt in an uncomfortable situation because his life was threatened. And even after Herod died, the angel of the Lord came back to Joseph and said, now those that were seeking the child's life is dead. Now you can return back to the land of Judea. But he found out that King Herod's son, Archelaus, was reigning in his stead. So he was still a bit fearful. So he went down to Galilee because it was prophesied that he would be in Nazareth. Watch this. So you mean to tell me that Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea and they were trying to kill him. He then had to go hide in Egypt because they were trying to destroy him. Then even after King Herod died, he had to hang out in Nazareth all because God called him to those places. I just wanted to tell you before we got into the text today that I know that you are in some tenuous situations. And I know you are in situations that are uncomfortable. And you wonder if the Lord is with you if the way is this hard. I just stopped by to tell you that God's call on your life is not predicated on comfort and complacency. God's call on your life is based on his purpose. And no matter how difficult the situation is, don't think that disqualifies you from being called by God. Don't somehow think that you have done something wrong or that somehow you're in the wrong space because you're embracing and you're facing some challenges that were unexpected because God calls his best people, hallelujah, out of the midst of the storm. Come on and shout glory. Hallelujah. So when the enemy tries to play with your mind, you let him know that I understand that I am yet called 
by God. So we find that Jesus grows up. Jesus is about to enter ministry. And what baffles me is in Matthew chapter 3, the Bible says that John the Baptist is out by the Jordan and he's baptizing sinners. Y'all agree with that? He's out there and he's baptizing sinners. And he's declaring, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when they come to him, he tells them, I'm going to baptize you for the remission of sins. But what surprised me was not that he was baptizing them. I, I was a little surprised to find out that his garment was camel's hair, coarse camel's hair. It was uncomfortable. The Bible says he ate locusts and wild honey. So he did not have a Del Frisco's membership card. His diet was not fantastic. His clothing was not fantastic. And he was one crying in the wilderness. And so he's in uncomfortable clothing with an uncomfortable diet in an uncomfortable place. And he's calling people out of their sin. And they're coming out of their comfortable homes to an uncomfortable place, to an uncomfortable prophet to get an uncomfortable word. And he's baptizing them, and somehow the people realize that even though he's calling them to a place of discomfort, that the comfort of the Lord outweighs the, dif the discomfort of their journey. Come on and say hallelujah. In other words, there's some joy in my salvation. There's some peace in my salvation. There's some strength in my salvation that outweighs what I'm going through. And the reason that I'm able to keep going is because the joy that I have. The world did not give it to me and the world can't take it away from me. Glory to God. The joy that I have that I'm saved and I'm sanctified and I'm Holy Ghost filled and I'm fire baptized and I've got Jesus on my side is not just a song that I sing, but it makes me feel like running when nobody's chasing me. It makes me feel like hollering when there's no reason to because the Lord has done something in my life. Oh, what a wonderful change has been wrought in my life since Jesus has changed me. Hallelujah. And so we find, though he's calling them to a place of discomfort, even though he's calling them out of their homes and he's calling them to the wilderness, they understand that there is some joy in this space. The Bible tells the story about the one that lost a coin and went and sold all that they had just so they could purchase the field and get that lost coin. Come on and say hallelujah. You ought to tell somebody we're troubled on every side, yet we're not distressed. Hallelujah. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're cast down, but we are not destroyed because there's something on the inside that's working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. And so we find that John is baptizing folks and he's calling them out of their discomfort, realizing that there is comfort in knowing who the Lord is. But what confuses me about this text is that John is going to sinners. He's calling sinners. And Jesus, who is sinless, shows up where sinners are. Come on and shout glory. I said, Jesus, who is sinless, hallelujah, he shows up where sinners are. Glory to God. How many people are grateful that you've got a Savior today? that shows up where sinners are. Hallelujah. How many people are thankful that you didn't dot every I, you didn't cross every T, but the Savior stopped by where you were. Hallelujah. That he had enough grace and had enough mercy to have pity and mercy on you and to see you and spot you in your sin. And even though you didn't dot every I, even though you didn't get it right, Jesus says, I'll walk with you and I'll talk with you and I'll tell you, you are my own 
own because there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ who walk not after the flesh but walk after the spirit for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but shall have everlasting life is there anybody glad that the savior who is sinless hallelujah stops down where sinners are come on and shout glory hallelujah now what stuns me about the text is that jesus goes to where sinners are and when john sees him john says listen jesus i am not worthy to tie up your shoelaces i'm not worthy to baptize you because you are sinless this water is for sinners uh, I can't baptize you, Jesus. And Jesus says to him, I want you to suffer it to be so. In other words, John, I don't disagree with what you're saying, but I want you to obey and baptize me anyway. It blew John's mind because how could one who is sinless be baptized? And Jesus essentially says, John, you don't have a vote. You got to do what God has called you to do. Come on and shout glory. Speaking of voting, on Tuesday, we've got this election. And voting is a civic duty. It is not a religious duty. And so there are some that are trying to tie your salvation into how you vote. On Tuesday, you get a vote. You can vote for whomever you want to vote for. I used to preach a sermon, and that sermon was, who are you campaigning for? And I would list all of Kamala's credentials. I'd list all of Trump's credentials. And then I would tell you about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Because I'm going to tell you right now that whoever ends up in the White House, You've got to understand that, they, that whoever's in the White House has an authority that they've got to bow down to. And the Bible tells us to pray for those who are in authority. Hallelujah. Have you ever thought that God might have set up this election this way so that the church would have to be the church? Come on and shout glory. Have you ever thought about God as saying, I'm sick and tired of the folks in the house of God being complacent, and I got to get them back to the place of Second Chronicles 7, 14, that if my people that are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, would seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, come on and shout glory. I know y'all don't want to talk about the election, I'm simply trying to tell you, you got a vote. Go ahead and cast your vote. Don't let anybody tell you how to vote. Don't let anybody try to condemn based on whoever you vote for. You got to look at the candidates and you got to either pick the best of the best or the, the, the less worst of the worst. Come on and say hallelujah. I'm just trying to tell you that you cannot put your trust in man. You're, you better trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Come on and shout glory. So when it comes to the election, you have a vote. But John did not have a vote. John the Baptist was told, you must baptize me even though I am sinless. Hallelujah. And it just gives me to know that his thoughts are not our thoughts. <laughs> Neither are his ways our ways. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are his ways and his thoughts above ours. Come on and say thank you, Jesus. I know that you're educated. I know that you've got wisdom. I know that you finished in the head of your class. But understand that all of your wisdom and all of your knowledge must take a back seat to the word of God. Come on and shout glory. Hallelujah, because the wisdom of man is foolishness to God. He alone is king of kings, and he alone is Lord of lords. And so John is told, listen, John, uh, it doesn't matter what you think about it. You've got to do it because this is what the Lord has said. 
I wish somebody with the Holy Ghost would say amen. Now, I know you don't really mean that amen, because when he says, bless them that persecute you, you roll your eyes. I know you don't really mean that, amen, because he says, pray for those that would despitefully use you. I know you really don't mean that, amen, because he says, when they would strive with you to go one mile, to go two. I know you really don't mean that, amen, because he says, when they would sue you for your cloak, also give them something extra. Amen, play. <laughs> but when the Lord gives you an assignment, hallelujah, sometimes the assignment is difficult. Sometimes the assignment is tough. Hallelujah. But you've got to take joy that you know who Jesus is. And if the Lord has called you to it, understand that there is joy in Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on and say, thank you, Jesus. You got to love your enemies. Hallelujah. Because God will make your enemies your footstool. Come on and shout glory. You got to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. Doesn't matter what's going on. I've got to do what the Lord has called me to do. And so, John, you will baptize me, even though you don't want to, even though you're not worthy. And so, John baptizes Jesus. The Bible says that the heavens part and the Spirit of God drops out of the sky like a dove. And then you hear a voice from heaven that says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And then the Bible says, after this, he is led of the, of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Come on and shout glory. Hallelujah. How many people want to hear a word from the Lord? How many people want to hear a word? Now, are you ready for that word to be tested? Amen, Plain. Come on and shout glory. Because once you get a word, hallelujah, the word is going to be tested. Come on and shout glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Daniel, you think you're a man of God? We're going to put you over in Babylon. We're going to try to tempt you to eat the king's meat. Now, let's see what you're going to do, Daniel. Everybody else that came over here is eating it. What are you going to do? And the Bible says Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not eat the king's meat, nor would he drink the king's drink. And that word had to be tested. Come on and shout glory. Tell somebody it's just a test. Hallelujah, it's just a test. Glory to God. The word had to be tested. You're going to be the head and not the tail. Woo, glory, hallelujah. Woo, Jesus, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Then you go to work on Monday and they own your case. You falling out. You upset. You done cussed somebody out on the elevator. But the word that he gives you, my God, has got to be tested. David, I'm going to anoint you to be king. Oh, glory. David is standing there. Jesse, he's getting anointed amongst all of his brothers. A little while later, now you got to go fight Goliath. Huh? Come on and shout glory, plants. Because the word that he gives you has got to be tested. But I'm here to tell you that if he gives you a word, he's also going to give you the grace that you need for that word. Come on and shout hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So the Bible says that he fasts for 40 days and for 40 nights. Now watch this, saints. You got, you got to watch this. The Bible says he fasts for 40 days, for 40 nights, and then it says, and that's when Satan came to him. Hallelujah. He didn't come right after the revival. He didn't come right after he got the raise and the promotion. He waited until he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Watch this. And afterwards was and hungered. Hallelujah. So at his weakest moment, hallelujah, and on his weakest day, glory to God, when he was most vulnerable to the enemy, that's when the enemy came. Is there anybody that can admit that it's when you're at your breaking point that the enemy is going to attack? Hallelujah. This is when the enemy comes. And the enemy says, 
if you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. And I asked the question in Bible study on Wednesday. I said, is eating bread a sin? Hmm. He had already fasted 40 days and for 40 nights. Hmm. What would the harm be if he ate bread? Tell your neighbor it's not about the bread. When you are pain, feeling pain in your flesh, and when your co-workers are getting on your last nerves, it's not about the job. When the kids are acting up and they just won't seem to listen, can I tell you, it's not about the kids and their behavior. May I tell you that when it seems like money is not right and you're about to lose your mind, it's not about the money because he's just poking at your flesh. But the poke in your flesh isn't even what it's about. Eve eats a piece of fruit. It's not a sin to eat fruit. What is it that he's really going after? The enemy is trying to distract you. What is he trying to distract you from? The Bible says that this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. And so God has given me a word of who I am in him. God has given me a word of who the Christ is and what the enemy is really after when he's messing with me on the job, when he's messing with me in my home, when he's messing with me with my children, when he's bothering me and ruffling up my feathers. It's not about the children. It's not about the family, but it's about who do I profess Jesus Christ is. Is he the Christ, the son of the living God? Is he Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end? Is he the first and the last? Is he the author and the finisher of my faith? Whom do men say that I, the son of man am. Some say Elias. Some say John the Baptist. But Jesus wants to know, who do you say that I, the son of man, am? Tell somebody it's not about the bread. It's about who do you say that Jesus is? Who is he to you? Is he a bridge over troubled waters? Who is he to you? Is he a rock in a weary land? Who is he to you? Is he bread when you're hungry? Is he water when you're thirsty? Is is he your refuge? Is he your strength? Is he your rock? Do you believe who Jesus is? Come on and shout glory. It's not about the bread. And so we find that Jesus is to ask to turn the stones into bread. But it wasn't about the bread. It was really about, are you going to believe who God says you are? Not when you're full, not when you just ate a meal. But I want to know after you fasted 40 days. I want to know after you're tired. I want to know when your flesh is weak. Do you still believe what God said about you? After you done waited one year, after you've waited two years, after you done waited three years, do you still believe who God says you are? After you've suffered loss, but I'm going to just tell you that I'm persuaded that nothing shall separate me from the love of God. Come on and shout glory. So understand that your temptations that your trials have nothing to do with the trial itself. It has everything to do with who God says you are. And if you're going to believe whom God says you are, hallelujah, come on and shout glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You're fearfully and you're wonderfully made. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. I will give you power in your head. The power of the enemy. Before I formed you in your mama's belly, I knew you and I ordained you and I called you a prophet. Hallelujah. Come on and shout glory. Hallelujah. So turn these stones into bread. And it wasn't about the bread. Come on and say thank you, Jesus. What we find happening in the text is Jesus tells a man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The enemy tempts him several times, and Jesus continues to fire back with the word. I'm fast forwarding here, but let me tell you, 
that the word of God is essential for your resistance of the enemy. Come on and shout glory. You've got to resist the enemy with the word of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You know, God is so awesome. Now watch this. Now, I don't know if you got your Bibles open still. The last temptation, the enemy tells him, fall down and worship me, and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. And in verse number 10, Jesus said, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And the Bible says, and the devil leaveth him. So he resists the enemy with the word, and the enemy flees from him. And then it says, and the angels came and ministered unto him. Can I tell you something, a secret, that when you are in spiritual warfare, that when you use the word of God, it draws heaven's power to where you are? Hallelujah. That the angels of God are attracted to the word of God. Come on and shout glory. Because Daniel in chapter 10, he's praying. And when Daniel is praying it, his prayers aren't answered. By the time the angel shows up, the angel shows up and says, listen, I was in a fight trying to get to you. The prince of Persia helped me back. He says, but I've come for your words. Come on and shout glory. The Lord says that my word, watch this, won't return to me void but it will accomplish that to which I sent it. Just like the rain comes from heaven and it gives water and bud to the earth, so will my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It will not return to me void. Glory to God. So once you begin declaring the word of God, you begin releasing heaven's power down to where you are. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. There are some battles that requires heaven's power. Come on and shout glory. All right. I'm just about done. I told you earlier that Jesus went to where sinners were to be baptized. And I told you that John had to baptize Jesus because that's the way that God wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. But I've got to be honest. There's more to the story than that. That Jesus, who was sinless, would go to where sinners are. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus knew no sin. So he didn't need to be baptized for the remission of sins. So why would Jesus go to be baptized. Why would God require Jesus to be baptized when he is sinless and knew no sin? Come on and say thank you, Jesus. It is simply because Jesus is the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundations of the world. Mm -hmm. It is simply because the Old Testament is full of sacrifices that were attempting to wash and cleanse mankind from their sin. My God. And if you study the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus, chapter 26, on the Day of Atonement, it would happen once a year. The priests would stand up before the tabernacle and they would bring two goats to the priest. One was the goat of God and one was the scapegoat. The goat of God was killed and blood was shed and the blood was shed for the remission of the sins of the people. But the scapegoat would be taken out to the outskirts of town. The priest would put his hand on the scapegoat and the priest would begin to declare all of the sins that the people had done. He would declare all of the sins of the people of Israel. He would talk about the lying and the cheating and the stealing and the murderers and the adulterers and the fornicators and bitterness and lust and envy and deceit and hatred and favoritism and unnatural affairs and pride and envy and jealousy. And this he would do for all of the sins, for all of the people for the past year. I'm sure it was a lengthy ceremony. 
and then the scapegoat would be led into the wilderness and set free. I said, why would Jesus have to go where sinners go and be baptized for the remission of sins? But my Bible tells me that God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. And the Lord put his hand on Jesus Christ and he transferred all of our sins and all of our guilt and all of our shame upon him. In every lie that we ever told, in everything that we ever stole, in every ungodly thing that we ever did was all laid upon the body of Jesus. And they stretched him wide and they put nails in his hands and they put nails in his feet. So he who knew no sin became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. So the reason that Jesus had to go and be baptized because Jesus became our scapegoat so that we can now live in power and live in peace. And what the Lord is saying to you all, since I've washed away your sins, since I took the penalty for you, I took the sting out of death and I took the victory from the grave. I've given you power over all the power of the enemy. I've given you joy and joy unspeakable. I've given you a peace that passeth all understanding. When you walk this life and when you go about your day and the enemy comes in like a flood, know that I'll raise up a standard against him. But don't you ever forget it's not about the bread. It's about who I say you are. It's about the call that's on your life. And don't you sacrifice. Don't you give up. Don't you doubt. And don't you quit because you believe who I've called you to be. Come on and shout glory. Thank God for a scapegoat. Thank God for Jesus. Go ahead and bless his name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I want you to have joy today. I want you to have peace today. And the one thing you cannot forget to do is to hold on to whom God has called you to be. Don't ever get spiritual schizophrenia. Hallelujah. But remember who God has called you to be. Because that's the whole game. That's what the enemy is after. He doesn't care if you come to church and shout. He doesn't care if you come to church and, and you can holler and scream. He wants to know, are you going to be who God called you to be? Come on and shout glory. Put your hands together for Jesus.